one of the guys in the experience last night, he asked me on my birthday, what was my best year? Oh yeah, and and what was he your best said, year? Uh, and he said his best year, he's not about my age, he said his best year was 32. He's got very wistful about 32. And my answer was this year. My 62nd year was absolutely my best year. So welcome to this episode of Becoming Fearless. I'm sitting here today with Sam Pond, and uh, Sam was a client, and I really wanted to interview him today because he really took the teachings in, and he's been killing it. Now, when Sam came to us, what was it about a year and a half ago, Sam? A little over a year ago. So uh, he was really a nervous wreck. He was really self-abusive. We see this a lot with clients, where their energy goes in and they attack themselves a lot. They can't stand in front of a beautiful woman and enjoy her because they're too busy worrying about what she thinks of them. And Sam, you had you had this big time, and and I really wanted to bring you in today because the transition you made from that to this guy who's just relaxed, yeah. open, feeling, having fun, and enjoying life, and, and living a life of adventure yeah. is absolutely amazing and astounding, and especially in that year and a half uh, dating beautiful women. And uh, number two is you're an older client. A lot of older clients come to us and think, "I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm too old," and we get this all the time. And uh, if Sam's comfortable, he can share that he just had a birthday yesterday, by the way. So yesterday I turned 63 years old. And 63, and, and he's killing it. We always say that you're as old as you feel with women, not the, the physical age you are. And if you feel young, they perceive you as young. So a 30 year old can feel like a, uh, an old man, and they'll, they'll, that's how they almost respond to him. And in Sam's case, a 63 year old can feel like a young man full of life and that's how they respond to you. I feel, I, in a way, I feel younger every day. Awesome. I, I, ha I hang out with younger people. I don't, I have a lot of old friends, love mm -hmm. them dearly, but we're going like this. Yeah. They're talking, they're waking up, they're, they're getting up from their chairs and going, oh God, getting old is a bitch. And that perspective, that worldview, is just like, oh God, I don't want to be part of that. A lot of that's the mind, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, my father is, is amazing in the sense that he pops out of bed at like 4 a.m. still and he's around he's in his 80s and he doesn't stop he's out living life and parties he has fun and his wife is way younger than him she's 16 years younger than him and when, when they were out here she couldn't even keep up with him yeah. and um he's just not i think that guy is never gonna stop he doesn't see i don't think he sees himself he jokes about it but i don't think he feels old or sees himself as old and it's the same thing i, I see more and more people doing this this, this like it's the energy of vitality. It's the energy of doing something new and living on the edge of new experiences and exploring that keeps us alive and you're still doing that. Yeah. I really want to visit that a little bit, but we want to go back and as we come back, does that start for you recently or has that always been? Have you always been the guy that's been on the cutting edge of new experiences, living by a full of life and energy or is that something that just started? Well, you know, I, I, I've always had a lot of, I think I've lived a pretty adventurous life. I've had, you know, two, solid careers in my life, really changing things up. I was always doing things a little differently. I could never imagine myself in an office from being an actor in my 20s and being a writer, director in, my, in advertising all those years. I, I just like traveling. I just like new experiences. My 15-year marriage sort of, well, you know, I won't even say that. It was my 15-year marriage offered even more opportunities for adventure. And I think about the birth of my son and raising a son. I wouldn't trade those raising a son years for anything. Well, let's, let's visit this because Sam, you literally, you have done a lot in your life, yeah. but a lot of your life was filled with stress yeah. and worry and doubt and anxiety and tr trying to prove something. And keeping it all at bay by deflecting tension wherever I was. My perspective of myself was I'm a happy-go-lucky guy, but my, so nice guy. Totally, totally nice guy. So when he talks about deflecting tension, if you've never heard our concept before, is, is as you get more comfortable with life, you're going to step more into more perceived tension. You know, maybe walking up to a beautiful woman has a lot of tension for you. And the ability to relax and enjoy that creates a certain sense of confidence. The ability to present in front of people a, a project and really stand to your guns about what you're creating and say, this is this, I think this would be a great idea. It takes a certain amount of tension when everybody's disagreeing with you. So what you were saying is that in your career, there was a lot of tension would come up and how could I diffuse it instead of face it? How could oh, I, I was, around it? How I, was an ex I was an expert at diffusing tension. Yeah. I mean, it was part of my skill in my job was yeah. 
the charming people into buying advertising ideas they were not comfortable with, charming actors into performing a certain way. It was like I had this little like magic touch and I went, oh, this is my, this is not just my skill, this is who I am. That was the mistake that I made. Okay, and so this is, now somebody out there might say, well, that sounds like a great skill set. Yeah, right. And, and it can be a great skill set, actually. You get a lot done with it. The question is, is are you doing it out of fear? Or are you doing it, like, are you stepping into tension and saying boldly, this is who I am? Or are you doing all these things because you don't want to upset somebody's emotions? You don't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah. You don't want to make them sad, mad, upset. And how much of that was going on? Oh, I, it was 100% fear-based. Mm -hmm. but, but as I said, it, I really thought it was me. I thought it was a, le real, it was a legitimate way to live a life. Mm -hmm. That if I could just keep everything at bay, all, all, all that tension at bay, uh, th then I could finish out my life without hassle. Without hassle. So doesn't that sound like a great goal in life? Get rid of all the tension. <laughs> to live my life without hassle. And, 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 sure. and be hassle-free. Yeah. We might as well just move to the mountains, get away from all people, become a renunciate. I and, thought uh, about that too. I thought, yeah. hey, there's happiness in the mountains too. But even the, the monks, you know, you think about it, they sit and meditate all day and they go, if they're not numbing out, they're going to go deep into all their deepest, darkest fears. And so then when people realize that's what they do, they, they're like, oh my God, I don't want to do that either, you know? Yeah. Just turn on the TV station, drink a bunch of alcohol, do something to numb out. And that's what most people do. I did that. I, I drank a lot of alcohol. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. So there was that period too, where you, you actually, how long, how long ago did you quit? Um, about nine years ago. Yeah. And I remember you had a great story around that too. So oh just, yeah. My yeah. nervous breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you remember you said you were in a restaurant you just made a phone call to somebody, right? And you said, I got to stop. Or was it a restaurant or someplace? You said you called somebody to help you. After 15 years of marriage, my body just, and drinking and the stress of that marriage of me trying to fix my wife and her, it was just a big mess, that my body basically started shutting down. Mm. My mind, I had no idea. I thought everything was going fine. I had a son, I was, oh, my career was going well. So, so on my, paper, you were perfect. On paper, I was perfect. I had a beautiful house and a beautiful wife and a son. And I didn't know my my mind was just keeping everything up, but my body was completely shutting down. And it got to a point over a few months time, I went to the emergency room twice. I couldn't understand why I'm aching. My, I couldn't, I started having problems seeing. And, and then one day I just had a total fucking meltdown. And I just started, I started going blind. I could not see, everything was too blurry to even see. I was driving around, I couldn't even believe. I even went to a creative presentation that day and I had no idea what the hell I was saying. Yeah, I'm wow. just showing up. What did you do about that? Is that when you realized you had diabetes? No, that was uh, that had been 15 years prior. Okay, so. so what caused you to stop all the drinking? Was it that moment? Like, well, it was because I started frantically making phone calls. I didn't know what was wrong with me, and things were really shutting down fast. And I sat in a bar and just started dying on the phone. And I finally that's the story. Yes, fi yeah, that's the story. And yeah. I finally got somebody. I was calling rehabilitation centers and my create I was like typing anything in the computer and I got a voice on the phone and I started I don't know what I said to her I started blabbering she said Sam calm down you're talking to the right person get on an airplane to Albuquerque New Mexico and you're gonna come stay with us where were you I was in San Francisco and I got on a plane the next day I I remember being in a hotel room near the airport I couldn't even tell my wife I was so I was so out of it I remember putting my wallet next to my phone, next to my keys, so I could find them in the morning because I couldn't, I was blind, I really couldn't see. Mm. And I went to a, this uh, rehab center that was all about uh, childhood trauma. Mm. And she said, you were traumatized, you were abused as a child and you, you just don't know it. And so how long did you spend there? Six weeks. Six weeks. And that, shit, that, that reset everything. Re it was a reset. Yeah, I came mm. out like, a, I felt like a scrub baby just, and after you got the alcohol, the eye, eyesight yeah. came back and everything. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty intense stuff. Like yeah, it was it. really, really, really intense. A friend of mine, psychiatrist, he said it wasn't actually a nervous breakdown. A nervous breakdown can kill can actually kill you. It's a serious medical condition. He said it was more of a shokuboku. What, what does that mean? Buddhist term for a spiritual kick to the head from which you, your life will change forever. Yep, it sounds about right. I've had a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember what they felt like. Um, and that's when I just started like exploring and scrambling. Of course, the marriage didn't, didn't couldn't couldn't last after that. So, so 
let's take a look. Like you, you really got started. I mean, your life basically. You grew up. You had a rough childhood, and you went through all of this. You went through the marriage. You ended up where you're at, mm. and then you decided you wanted to make a, a bigger change. Now, at what age did you really decide you wanted to get into this work and and, make, and shift everything? Because I'm assuming after that things got better. But they still, yep. like that age, that you still didn't become, like you wanted to get out there and learn to meet women and, and go out yeah. and have fun and actually, and you didn't understand what that meant, no. but something had to change. So can you talk about from that point on, like we've got this idea that your life, you went through a lot in your life mm -hmm. and, you had, and you had a lot of trauma. At what age, what was going on, what caused you to want to make a change? So I was 55 when I had the nervous breakdown. When I came out of it, I just tried everything from landmark to Buddhist studies to yoga. I, mean, I just was just grasping. And um, then about three years ago, I met Johnny. Uh, Johnny Soporno. Johnny Soporno. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it was a, I, I, I just heard what he was doing. And because up to that point, I thought, oh, if I just keep trying and being a good guy, and learning more that women are just going to start showing up. I was surprised that I could not attract anybody. And by the way, this is what a lot of people do. They think that if I do more of what I'm already doing, <laughs> yeah. something will eventually change. I think Einstein called that the definition of insanity. Insanity. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'll just do more of it. It didn't work this time. I'll just double double down. Right. And so. Um, so you and then I'm meeting. And then meeting Johnny is the first god time I ever talked to a guy about girls. About how did you meet Johnny? Just the guy I met in Landmark. He had just spent time with Johnny, described him, and said, "It's not. He's not pickup, and he's something else." And I just went. That was an, that was one of those instant decisions. I called him up, and I showed up on his doorstep the next day. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to that. Instant. This is really important. So he goes. Literally, he instantly decides this guy's right for me. Johnny's in Vegas, right? Yep. So you end up on his doorstep the next yep. day. Where were you at when you did that? In San Francisco. So again, like. Albuquerque, New Mexico, next day. He, he's from San Francisco to Albuquerque. Now he's yeah, in San Francisco the next day, Vegas, okay? <laughs> so he's a quick decision maker. This is yep. really important, so continue on. And uh, Johnny blew my head open with all new ways of looking at the world, everything. I mean, this basic thing talking to Johnny was everything that you think is true is not necessarily true. And that mm -hmm. was actually a really good message for me. Um, I still couldn't at that time access this energy with, with women. I still was looking for Part of my head was looking for techniques or more information. Well, what was your dating life at that time before you went to Johnny? <laughs> I was uh, meeting women on Tinder who I just had, I must have been on 50 Tinder coffee dates and all of them were just fine. Nothing, Nothing was happening. I met a girl here and there. Okay, so you go out with Johnny, he blows your mind. Yeah. And he starts talking about, and he starts seeing how he has a lot more access to his sexual energy. Yeah. Turn on, he's not ashamed of it, he enjoys it. So yeah. Thing. Yeah, that's a, a lot of talk, just releasing a lot of shame around Johnny, because he's shameless. Yeah, he's very shameless. Uh, and uh, one thing I got from him was um, the idea that I like who I like. I'm not going to try to like someone who I don't. I can't be sexually attracted to someone I'm not sexually attracted to. Mm. And that just to open up my, just to open things up, whether it's younger women or... Well, well let me ask a that. question on that. This is a really interesting question. I think I've asked it of a lot of audiences. I actually asked it yesterday. I think is, have you ever gone out on a date, on one of those tender dates or another date, feeling like you've never met the girl, maybe you've only seen her pictures, but you feel like it's your job to impress her before you even show up and meet her and decide if you like her. And yeah. if you don't, if she doesn't like you, you don't do a good job on the date. You're a bad man because it's the man's job to impress the woman on the date. And uh, maybe, maybe I think I've been doing that my entire life. Yeah, yeah. It puts a whole added pressure on men that really is unfair to the women, even because don't you think a woman would rather have you show up and decide, do I even like you, before I start trying to impress you? Don't you think a woman would rather have you be real with her and say, you know what, there's something interesting about you, or you know what, I'm I'm really not interested beyond the first date, so let's just end this coffee date and call it the night. Yeah. How much more powerful is that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a, yeah, I, it's funny you said that I was actually trying to impress these girls before I even met them. Yeah. Which is, un, which is insane. Yeah. I look back on it. Yeah. It's, it's all about getting them to like you. Yeah. And that is a sure sign you're chasing validation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you, we were talking about this earlier as we were walking around the complex here. 
is that your whole thing growing up was about getting validation, getting validation from your family, getting validation in acting class, getting yep. validation as a producer, getting like your whole career was built on being a master at getting people to validate. I just felt a sudden surge of something in here, like this kind of sadness about mm. how how desperate that search was. And again, I didn't know I didn't know it. I thought I was just doing what. Yeah. Well, I did the same thing. Yeah. You know, that's what the nice guys are trying to do. We're trying to get rid of all the tension, make everybody happy, and get everybody to tell us what a great guy we are. Yeah. And we we don't even care if we like the person or want to be around the person. We need their validation, and we can build a pretty good career doing this. But how much stress comes with that? How what's the toll on your body? What's the toll on your mind? The well, there's no deep satisfaction because mm -hmm. once you get like an advertising, it's telling you that if I won a big award, it'd be like this crack candy hit. And then the next day, there was kind of a sadness and like, where's, where's the next one? I got to beat the last one too. Got to beat the last one. Yeah. Right. You don't Once you get win a so. can's lion, then what's next? Like, is, that, is that the biggest award in advertising? It's one of the bigger ones. Yeah. yeah. It's international. Award. And by the way, this is the man that's responsible for some pretty big ad campaigns, right? <laughs> yeah. I think we were looking at the uh, North Face one the other day. Yeah, the North Face. Yeah. What, what's the, the Never Stop Exploring? Never Stop Exploring. He came up with that. So that was all him. If you see that on a sweatshirt, you, you, now you know the face of the man that, that came up with that. Yeah, had to fight, had to fight to sell him that. When we pitched the business, they said, okay, we we're really interested in you, don't touch our tagline, which was expedition proven. That was their tagline. I said, nobody gives a crap about expedition proven. <laughs> I, anyway. I, you have to think about it. Yeah. What, what does that mean? And so they're angry when I showed them this new line, never stop exploring. Like, this, you're an exploration, you're an exploration brand. And they said, no, no, we're never going to. And one of their athletes saw it and went, oh, that's who we are. <laughs> one of, like, Conrad Anker said, that. Nice. And yeah, that yeah, was really, again, but I was totally validated by that, too. <laughs> <laughs> you're still proud of it today. No, I'm okay. proud of it, yeah. It's okay to enjoy validation. Yeah. The, the problem comes in is if, that if you don't get it, you're unhappy. You need to go chase it like another crackhead. Like, yeah. you can enjoy it when you get it. And if it's not there, that's fine. And, and right. that's the difference. Um, so you go from there, you're in your 50s, you meet Johnny, mm -hmm. and Johnny's presenting. Now, I don't know if this time with Johnny, you start to realize how much, like he, he doesn't need the validation as much as he just doesn't give a fuck, right? Yeah. And here you are, do you, do you start to see that at this time? You're making these quick decisions, you're moving forward, do you start to see that? Or what do you see, what do you get? What, no, what? I go back and I still feel a scramble. I was still like grasping for, the answer. I was grasping for the answer at the time. What can, what what can I fit into my life that will make me good with women? But I didn't really know what I was looking for. I did feel a certain sense of freedom. Well, did, that, you, did you know what you wanted from women? No, no. You no. Just wanted to go out with them and and, and uh, have what, sex with them. And, and were you even embarrassed to say that? I'm supposed to want. Oh them. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So there's to a lot of sexual cuddle. shame at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now you say it so casually, but yeah. yeah. I just want to hold them and cuddle and comb their hair. Right. Yeah. 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 So there's that whole thing with a lot of nice guys say stuff like this. That's funny. I'm feeling embarrassed by that. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't know what you wanted with women. You're exploring. And then. Yeah. And then I met Zan. He came to speak at something. I went to the Johnny. Zan, for in case you haven't met Zan, I mean, we have him in a lot of videos, but look up there. You look up our videos with Zan Perry. And The Alabaster Girl is an amazing book he wrote that yeah. you're reading for the third time, you told me. Reading for the third time. Okay, so it swept up in it. Tell us about Zan. Well, Zan showed up and he had totally different energy. Now, Johnny had a panel of guys and it was pick up, pick up, pick up. And then one guy was a martial arts guy and it was like all very macho. And then Zan shows up and I just went, oh, him. Yeah. Who's he? He had a lot of joy. Joy, pirate, adventurous spirit, yeah. traveling the world. Yeah. You know, uh, cutting edge of new experiences, like like your slogan, never stop exploring. Never stop exploring. Maybe that's my, hey, maybe that's my slogan. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe you really wrote it for yourself. Maybe I wrote it for myself. So you see Zan on this panel, and and again, what what did you do that day? Is there like this sense of a quick decision, like I've got to work with this guy, or what happened? I pretty much cornered him. So again, he's making a quick decision, stepping right into tension here. When it comes to what you want now, you're starting to step into tension. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I heard him speak. I grilled him for a bit. I went, I ordered his book on Kindle and I read half of it. And the next day I cornered him and just wanted to, I just wanted to suck whatever he had out of him. Mm. It's funny when I showed up for that conference, I met him and I didn't even know who he was. I met him, I thought, here's this dude. So I was talking Johnny's to him. Johnny's conference? 
Johnny's conference. I met Zan in the, down in the hotel lobby. It was just like, oh, here you got him just talking to him like a guy. Yeah. Then he starts getting surrounded by all these people. And I got swept up in that. I felt there was something that moved me that I wasn't, I didn't have to look for information anymore or techniques. Because I found myself, I was actually searching for those I didn't really know. Anything. Zan talks a lot about the feeling of being a seducer, a man who loves women, and, yeah. and a man that's loved by women. And he talks, and he writes about it in the book. And um, so a lot of guys get really wrapped up in that feeling, especially feeling-based artistic guys really love that idea. Uh, I was drawn yep. to it many years ago. Before I even started this company, uh, when I was first learning, I was drawn to these early videos of Zan, and I would watch them over and over and over again. And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, now we're good friends, but back then I didn't know who he was. And there was a sense of, I wanted to meet Zan. So there's another another thing I had to my list of, that I manifested because I didn't just meet him. We we hang out, and party together, and now we're good friends. And actually, we teach together because he's so poetic and so artistic and so flowing. It's not this sense of like, when you read his book, you could take some of the stuff he says up there and turn it into a one, two, three, four technique system, but that would ruin the feeling of what he's yeah. teaching. Yeah, yeah. So I always say the book is a primer. You read the book to experience the feeling he's describing and if you sit in that feeling long enough and there's a lot of layers of feeling so you can read it several times like you are and if you sit in that feeling long enough you start to feel it in your body yeah and the first time i read it i was sitting in, in bucharest romania reading it in a coffee shop and all these girls were the busiest co starbucks in town i love the six just non-stop pretty girls coming in and out and i would sit there and read the book and i start to feel this turn on from stuff he's describing of the, this, these dances with men and women from a seduction perspective and i remember looking up at girls and they just smile at me because they could feel me in the moment present heart open turned on yeah when you read the book of feeling it invites you into flow you just in flow you just get into flow with women so. and that's what he likes to do yeah so you so you see this and you, you corner zan and then what do you do I signed up for their fundamentals course, and I was still terrified of, of women, but I still had, I, there was just something in me, and I was talking to someone yes, last night with the experience about, why us? It was Mark, the guy from Panama. Like, why us? I don't quite understand what it was in me that had to move this forward, and I have this sort of deep curiosity. And so some don't. people don't do anything with it. Some people don't do anything, and why has it become a passion of mine? And Mark said, well, it's a good hobby, and at first I thought, well, that's kind of downplaying it, but you know what? I'd rather have this as a hobby because mm -hmm. now it's more of a, it's become a passion of mine. Well, it's that, it's that part of you that we kind of picked on earlier that wants validation so badly was the motivating force to learn this stuff. Because mm -hmm. once you realize what you're craving is, is true human connection. That's exactly what it is. You didn't that's have exactly it what it a is. Child, yeah. And when you start to realize you don't need to get validation to feel true human connection, you're relentless to go after the, the, the connection. You just, you don't stop. Because that's what life's all about, when you get, especially when you get is. older. Yeah. And age is another big motivator for me. Every time I get a little older, a goal that's been in the back of my mind for a while starts to rise in, on its uh, level of priority until eventually I cannot ignore it anymore because I'm getting older. Yeah. And, and uh, so for you young guys, don't wait. And, let that priority come up now if it's a big one. Don't put it down and think I can do it next year because that next year comes fast. I was thinking about being young. Someone asked me once about do I have any resentments and I don't really have any resentments because I understand because now that I have far more empathy and compassion for myself and I just didn't know any better. Yeah. But there was something inside me I just didn't know how to access. And now with guys like you and just watching this video, now guys, because 40, 50 years ago, there was no access to any information at all. Yeah, there wasn't. There wasn't much. So now this kind of thing can actually invite up that little kernel that rises up from young guys right now. Yeah, and I think it's so needed in today's society mm -hmm. um, with everything going on. But we're, we'll get into that. Maybe we'll get into that. But <laughs> I want to go back to, so you, you take the fundamentals course, and, and you really, and I, I think you really opened up a lot with Zang. Because I met you yeah. in, in uh, Amsterdam, right? Yep. I was speaking at one of Zan's events in Amsterdam. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was swept. What really helped me was this permission to be in the world of women and not to have to be any te technical about it. So you're not trying to trick, this is the key, I think one thing Zan teaches, you're not trying to trick them into bed. You realize right. you're not trying to trick them to like you. Right. If they want you there. This whole idea, they guys, you don't you. realize that 
women want to meet men. They want men. They just want you to be normal. Yeah. You know, I don't even want to say they solid. show up. I used to say solid. I used to say really masculine. But the truth is, that you're happy with normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I started feeling more normal around yeah. women. But I was also absolutely terrified. I was still terrified. But there, I was. That was be just beginning to calm down. Living a life up here in my head was just beginning. You know. Okay. This is what it is. This is actually. I never thought about this. My life was up here. And then, and with Zan, it started to drop into in my heart, heart. Yeah. and I started to feel that. That was a huge gift. Because now you're able to relate emotionally and feel all these emotions you couldn't feel before. Yeah, yeah, and feel my own compassion, my own sense of adventure, and my own. So it was like a lot of. It was just like this started getting connected. Yeah. Without your heart, life is boring. Yeah, yeah. Without your heart, you can just live. You know. That's what you got. You got that to... was actually interesting. What I learned in that. Um, trauma center was uh, the first thing that they said, by the way, this is actually this important part of the story. When I got there, I was completely out of it. I couldn't even talk. I couldn't look at people. I totally shut down. And the woman who ran the place took me by the shoulders and made me look at her. And she said, Sam, I still feel emotional when I say this. The man who got you here is the man you are. That was the rescuing statement of my life. It's a beautiful statement, actually. I still feel it now. Because that's the strong part of yourself. You yeah. showed up. That I showed up. I made yeah. the decision I was able to battle through. But they described it, talking about head and heart, is that when you were born, when trauma happens in early in your life, or at any time in your life, when you're a child, you're, you're, head, you're, you're born with your head and your heart linked. They're in perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. And if you, at the moment of trauma, they go bam, and you your heart gets buried deeply and you just run your whole life from your head and you can live a very successful, it's a huge amount of clients. Life yeah. from your head. Yeah. Have and your heart all buried, just buried away. Successful. You can also become a psychopath. And, and successful is very relative because like you can have financial success, but are you, the question is without a heart, can you ever really be happy in this world? And uh, without feeling your heart, that doesn't mean you don't have a heart. So I've, I've run into a lot of clients that can't feel their hearts and they have big hearts, but they're so disassociated, disassociated. They're, they've actually numbed out from here down, so they can't feel their bodies. And I see other clients that have numbed their hearts completely. Yeah. And what it is, is when we talk about heart, just for you guys out there, um, and I'd love for you to describe this because as you start to drop into your heart, you start to feel a lot more vulnerability, right? And it starts to happen from right in here. And it actually is through more parts of the body than just the heart, stomach, heart, and everything. But uh, this relationship to your body starts to become more important than thinking. What you're feeling, because what you, everything you feel, you feel through the body. And then you think, feel, think. The thinking becomes really dominant when you don't want to feel your heart. It's like this hard drive in your computer that turns on high and won't stop go spinning. And it spins really fast to keep you from feeling what's going on in here. Yeah. But when that hard drive slows down and the energy that's up here starts to come back down to here, it's like, whoa. And if there was sadness and angst and anger or hurt in your heart and you, you go back into it, there's a sense of, I want to go back up here. You know, <laughs> this thing hurts. And yeah. what we do is a lot of the work is learning to let go of all that hurt and get back in touch with the, what the heart was built for at the, at the higher levels, which is compassion, love, appreciation, joy, and that type of stuff. So that's a process you started to go through with Zan. Yep. 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 Yeah. And as you describe it, it's almost like, my heart, it was, my head, my heart would get involved and then it would like bounce off and go back into my head. But slowly it just started yeah. coming in here and, and, and started getting a little bit lower because I started to embrace a greater sense of connection. Was that scary coming out of your heart for the first time? It was confusing because I could feel compassion for others. I started growing compassion for other people. I still had problems and I didn't know it, having compassion for myself. Yeah. I always had to work harder. So, I got to solve this. I got to fix this. Let's talk about the nice guy for a minute. So the nice guy starts to feel his heart, which a lot of nice guys do. So you start to feel your heart. What does the nice guy do with all those emotions? They're rising and falling. But let's say you're, you're, you know, your heart starts to open and you start to feel all this stuff. Then you go into a meeting and somebody in the meeting says, I don't like that. And you feel it in your heart. Or, yeah. or a girl says, That's right. a girl says, you know, why did you wear that shirt? Or, I, or looks at you funny and kind of turns away because you're funny. Look, what does that do? Yeah. Well, how does your heart respond? To it's that? a seizing. It's exactly what it feels like in a, in a meeting when you are not, when I was not validated, I could feel that 
constriction and then it was just like all the energy would just go straight into my head and I would go into problem solving yeah. solve the situation that's because your heart has trauma and it's unresolved so when you when your heart is open with trauma uh, it hurts or that or you haven't learned to ground your heart which is another part of the body that yeah. the whole body has to be felt so when you're just feeling the heart you don't feel the lower body you don't feel the grounding mechanism of the body it's like having an ungrounded anything that's ungrounded in electronics it doesn't work right Plus, what happens is, for me, and I've seen it in other men, is you just get into blame. It's like when the heart is shut down, it's just like, blame the world. Yeah. And then you can get to be the victim of the world. Yeah. He's an asshole, she's a bitch. Yeah. You live that life. What's well, a reaction, right? It just becomes a reaction. So you feel vulnerable. This is a simple reaction. You feel vulnerable. You get angry in response to the vulnerability. You have one of three choices. Attack the, the source, attack yourself. Like, I'm a piece of shit, he's a piece of shit, one of those two. Or use that anger constructively, because that's what it's really for. It's mm -hmm. extra energy to grow. So now I can use it to face my own fear and say, you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to face this fear and I'm going I'm to step into it. I'm going to feel it fully. Yeah, that's and cool. that's the correct use of anger. What a lot of people teach is how to repress the anger. And that's going to really repress all your life force. That's why the nice guys get stuck forever, because they're constantly re repressing the anger. Yeah. You want to use the anger to face all your vulnerability, to grow back up and out and, and set yourself free again. Yeah. Now it feels like kind of a buzz. Yeah. It, well, it moves into courage. Yeah. It moves into pride and courage usually. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you start to feel powerful and you have control of it and courage. You can direct it into, into, into things of courage. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. You feel the, the shift of how much calmer you just became talking about it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, so as then you start to feel your heart and your heart's all over the place. And I remember going to Spain and I don't totally remember you in Spain. There was a lot of people there. Gave a talk. Oh, and and the, the, Amsterdam. Yeah, excuse me, Amsterdam. Yeah, Amsterdam. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking of Spain. Make sure I'm the right country. Yeah. I'm thinking of Spain because you just talked about Valencia before the right. meeting. Yeah, I was on an Amarati adventure. i have been yeah. to a couple of conferences and I was seeing the world. And, uh, and I remember traveling. all the students talking about all their adventures they were having. Yeah. Oh, they right. were amazing adventures. You know, some of these guys were running with the bulls. And, Yep. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. And so I come up and give a talk. Yeah. You gave a talk and I'm sitting there and I still feel like a, a bit of an outsider. I was like, oh, look at all these cool guys. Even though I'd been involved for a while, I still felt like I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I still felt a 54 year old like teenager. 55 year old teenager. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Any yeah. of you ever feel like a <laughs> 55 year old teenager? Yeah. And you were talking and you were really grounded. And you're making sense and uh, you had an ability to look. I felt like, I felt as an audience member that you were talking to me. Like even if your eyes glanced past me, I thought, oh, he's, uh -oh, he's going to call on me. <laughs> That's what I remember thinking. And you were really grounded. And I just like, when I first saw Zen, I went, oh, that guy. I'm going to go, I'm going to go talk to him. It's funny because you and Josh were both at that event. Josh works for us. He's our lead coach now. You and Josh both decided immediately, immediately. And Josh literally i got literally. mobbed after the event couldn't he couldn't get to me or dave my partner because we were both being mobbed so um so josh uh, just contacted dave the next day signed up for a workshop that weekend and flew over from amsterdam straight to bucharest yeah took the workshop yeah and that was and i remember josh was like a dark hole in the corner yeah i talked to him like, who is this guy it's like a, it's like a dark hole at that in amsterdam yeah at that time yeah and then well, the neat part was you both showed up at the event in Bucharest because Josh was a student. He was yeah. going through his process. And then you show up with Zan <coughs> and sit down. I remember we walking in the room and it was that, literally, this was, had to be one of the heaviest groups we ever worked with. Like I, I've been doing this for a long time and this group was just apathy, heavy, central, lots of pain in their bodies. And we had like 12 guys with lots of pain in their bodies. Yeah. And you guys can walk in in the middle of that because Zan's going to give a talk. And I see you come in. I remember your scarf. I remember you sit down <laughs> and I was thinking, I can only imagine what these guys think is going on in here because of the energy in the room. You could have cut it with a knife. Yep. So yeah. Thick. And we had just come out of Therme, which is like a water park, <laughs> we had a beautiful spa water park. We had all the sunny energy. We go yeah. into this cave of emotions. Yeah. And that's really, now we're doing something there because you were talking about experiencing the heart energy, which is this light and, 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 and this energy. And part of the heavy energy is heart. It's the closed off, heavy heart energy. It's shut down. But another part of it is, the, is teaching guys to ground and feel their lower body and root into the earth so they feel grounded. And so there's a lot of that going on all weekend long. And you walked in the middle of that process 
because people are in resistance to doing it. They're in resistance to grounding. They're in resistance to their sexual turn on. They're in resistance to their heart. So yep. when they first go back into it, a lot of times they have to move through some apathetic energy, some heavy energies. And I think the shock that I had was that I hadn't, I had no connection to that part of me at that time. I was still in what I was in a flowy Zan world and I was still, I still wasn't down there. So I didn't quite understand it. In fact, I kind of judged it like, what the fuck is going on there? Yeah. Who are these guys? But it was still compelling. Clearly it was compelling to me. There's something that was magnetic for me. Yeah. Cause you signed up pretty much right after that. Yeah. And you started working with us too. And you worked with us and Zan. I know you're great friends with both of us still. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and now I remember you coming in. To the workshops and i remember how self-abusive you were that's the first the, month, the main thing i remember and i love being around sam now back then it was really hard to be around you because everything yeah. was about how you're perceived what's wrong with me why am i broken how, victim consciousness there was this heavy inward poor me kind of energy and i was like yeah, yeah and we would see you do something really good and then you would just discount it like yeah but at this 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 didn't happen you know yeah and so can you talk a little bit about that, that process? Because that process had to be going on your whole life. At 55 oh, yeah. Years, I had no months. access to it. Actually, because the other side of the self-abuse. Oh, you were older than 55 at this time, weren't you? Yeah, I was 50. Not, I was divorced and went to the rehab when I was 54. So this was like 59. Yeah. Okay. So when you were at the, 60. So when you were in Amsterdam, you were closer to 59. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, the, so what was difficult about it was that I was self-abusive, but I wasn't allowing myself even early to feel it because I would just, my head would just ping up and, and make a joke or try to solve things or keep things light. I, I, I just, it was just had so much jittery so energy. Since you were ignoring the self-abuse. Ignoring would mean I was making a choice. Oh, so you'd repressed it so long you I had really know. repressed it. Yeah, yeah, I had no idea. It just seemed like life. And so when you went back down into it, that was rough for a little while, wasn't it? Oh, it was really rough. I mean, I got a lot of the first experience. Uh, I felt really grounded. Then I did a live event, and that's when the live event, and, and I was still like, I could feel, even thinking back in my body, I could feel my body just go down here and ping, ping, ping. It was like, it, it was, was like- Was this a week long or a weekend? Uh, I did the experience, and then I did a month or two later, came to the two week, two, two day live event. Okay, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that, I remember what you went through. I specifically remember all the stuff you went through your big 40 minute release, and you're playing the guitar on stage, and the emotional song, and all that stuff. Oh, no, that's the week long. The, the yeah. live event was when I stood in front of Emily, one, one of the models, uh -huh. and, and I thought because I still, there's so much energy here that was all bouncing. It was like, I just remember electricity still going through my body. Uh -huh. And she smiled and I smiled and I laughed and she laughs. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going pretty well. And she looked at me and she said, you are so manipulative. And I went, fuck. I just felt it all the way through. The manipulations I did with people all of my life, manipulations to myself, the charm. And that just set me down like a one month I really had to dive. I dove deep, but Josh helped me out through a lot of that. We worked a lot with Josh in that period. Yeah. And uh, so it was a, that, that manipulation was all a nice guy. Totally nice guy. How the nice guy gets through life. And it's amazing skill. Yeah. I mean, it helped me in business, yeah. but uh, it didn't work for me. Yeah. So the self abuse started. That's when I really became aware of the amount of self abuse. The question I asked, did it help you in business? Or did it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, how successful would you have been without it? How much farther might you have gone if you were just real? So people say this all the time, like I beat myself up because it makes me work harder. And I'm like, well, does it? Or does it slow you down? Maybe you're capable of 10 times more without the self abuse. It takes a lot. I came to realize it takes a lot of energy. The self abuse takes a lot of energy. It does. Saps now imagine all that energy you directed into your success. Right, into flow, right? Yeah. yeah, now I have access to it, yeah. so. So you, so you go in there and she, she busts you on that. She's really yep. good at that, she loves, she sees the manipulation. Yep, fast. manipulative, needy, and that's when I first got really called out on it, or the first time I really felt it. It was one of my rock bottoms with you guys. <laughs> it was good rock bottom. Good rock bottom. Yeah, yeah so it, it helped me. Uh, build up from there yeah and i became really aware of the amount of self-abuse that i would 
Because you were disidentified with all this energy, so you started to feel it all again. You started to get into a relationship. Yeah. And then once you got in a relationship with it, you had to learn to let it all go, all the, all the negative self-talk go yeah. that had been buried. It's like, it's like when you're digging for oil and you hit this bedrock that's so intense, like you need a diamond drill bit to get through it. And sometimes we have so much impacted and embedded subconscious thoughts and emotions that we, we, we can release, but we hit these surface and we don't want to go into it. Yeah. And yeah. so you need that moment where it cracks, like Emily making that statement. You need yeah. that moment and then you can start the process of releasing more and then eventually you hit the oil. And it just Absolutely. And then it, boom, it takes off. And yeah, it's an interesting image that it creates all that TNT creates this, this cave, mm -hmm. this chasm. And then it starts to fill, which feels bottomless and dark. Yeah. And then it starts to fill with oil. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, black gold. <laughs> black gold. That's what it felt like. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. And then now you have this relationship to the earth. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And all that stuff you've kept out now has a place to, to fill in. And then all that energy wants to rise yeah, up. Yeah, it wants right? to rise up. That's yeah. cool. And so now you're, you end up, you do that, and then you do the week long. Two week long. Yeah. And I remember that was pretty intense for you. Like, Boy, talk about still digging deep. I do remember the release with Alia, 40 minutes of you just processing mm. so much deep stuff. And I do remember some of it with Zan. I ran into him later and he said, I saw Sam at the end of the workshop when he was on break. <laughs> and I, I just, he said something about it. He's like, he looks so drained or something. Yeah. I don't remember what he said yeah. exactly. I'm paraphrasing. But and you're saying, for the guys who don't know, you're saying a release. Let's call it what it was, was a sobbing, snot filled. Every orifice was dripping and draining yeah. deep sobs and howls. And I smile because I know where that, why that takes them. It takes them to this amazing, much better place. Yeah. 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 And it didn't stop there. It lasted for on and off for the next three days. I was accessing stuff. Oh God, it was so painful. And, but then what happened? It's like, um, I let go of all this like these scuba weight belts, like all the anchors and the things that were weighing me down. I had no idea they were weighing me down. And it just, things just started getting lighter and lighter. That's what it felt like. Yeah. And suddenly you weren't beating yourself up as much, were you? or maybe not at all. I mean, the guy I see now is such a joy to be around. He's so positive and having so much fun. And, uh, yeah. and so it's fascinating to me the guy I see now is creating a better life every year, more fun. Yeah, and the self-abuse doesn't hasn't disappeared. I can just recognize it mm -hmm. as a as so you a don't take it personal. falsehood. Yeah, I don't take it personally. It's usually how it starts. Very much. You, yeah. you start to disassociate from the ego or the other parts of the abusive parts of the ego, and you just see them as noise in the background or whatever. You can. Yeah. A crying child. It's yeah. like, you don't take it personally. Yeah, okay. He's, he's upset. Yeah. He's, but he's not dying. And sometimes I do. And sometimes I, I do. It. And sometimes they can take me out. But then that helps me find a little bottom that gives me, he says, like some Even texture more. to life. It gives me more to understand myself better. Well, anytime you find a place you have, you're still identified with and you break it up, it becomes exciting at a certain point because you know your, your life's only going to grow more. After yeah, that. Each yeah. bout, something bigger is going to happen. Yeah. Something more exciting, something more real is going to come out of it. Yeah. And, and um, your ego doesn't want you to know it. Yeah. No. Every time it feels you grow, it says, you know, Sam, you're really not that great, or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It takes you down and you go, oh, there's that voice. Yeah. I always understood the voice, but I never felt the voice before. And now you're hearing it, feeling it, saying, yeah. letting it go. Um, and so then I really want to talk about a couple other things, but the song, you know, we, we're not going to ask you to play. It was pretty intense for you, but yeah. there was this in the, in the two week long, he kept, he plays the ukulele. He's very good. And he has this one song he loves to sing. And that song was huge, was a huge transitional point for you because the song had so much personal meaning and emotion. Mm. And he got the courage just to play it in front of all the students and models one day. And it was, it had the whole room just floored with, with feeling. Yeah. And I remember that that was a big, it was getting you used to expressing emotion and vulnerability in front of others in a powerful, solid, grounded way, not in a weak. Yeah, a without group. a performance way. Yeah. Like I could take the facade down. Yeah, yeah it was a song after that big stop build release. Um, uh, I went back to my room and I traveled with the ukulele. I like to sing and I just started singing the song I'd heard 30 years before by Tom Waits about two boys, a boy boy singing to his friend about all the adventures they're gonna have. 
And at the end, it turns out one of the boys is in a, is in a wheelchair. And boy, I, that song made me cry 30 years ago. And for some reason, it was the perfect song to release on because I was both boys. Mm -hmm. I was the boy rescuing the wounded boy and uh, I was the wounded boy needing rescue. Oh, I get emotional just thinking about it. I still sing that song, I start crying. It's amazing how the mind works. Do you know the name of it? Kentucky Avenue. So if you guys want to hear it, you can look up Kentucky Avenue. Yeah, I dare you not to cry, cold-hearted <laughs> bastards. <laughs> Uh, if you if you cry, put it in the comments. Please. Yeah, right. Or if you don't, um, so uh, so that's that's another big moment for you. And yeah. you just keep having these big moments because we go back to what we talked about in the beginning. Yeah. Was that something that um, Napoleon Hill said? That successful people, when he studied five hundred of the world's most successful people over twenty years, they make decisions quickly and change their mind slowly, if ever at all. They yeah. step into the tension quickly and they stay in it. They're good at saying no to a lot of things they don't need, all the things they don't need, and they're great at saying yes to the very things they need. They just go, no, 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 yes. And throughout this whole story, I hear you doing that over and over again. It's one of the skills you have. That's, that is a major skill. That's attention skill. That is stepping in attention. You know, you probably did it in business, and that was one of the areas you were comfortable with, but you did it with uh, Johnny. You did it with us. Yeah. You did it with Zan. You did it with... And that's why you're I never really thought about that, but yeah, that, I guess that that's a skill that I had. That was an impulse I had all my life. I could make mm -hmm. decisions pretty quickly. There's a lot of people who make decisions slowly, and some of them make decisions slowly and change their mind slowly. They'll be successful, but they take a while to make decisions. Some people make decisions slowly and change their mind quickly, which are going to be the most unsuccessful people in the world. Well, I mean, if you're in that category where you're like, I can't, I can't decide, I can't say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then ten minutes later, no, I changed my mind again. You know, it's like. Where's your, you're constantly stepping out of attention. So you- And the worst decisions I made <clears throat> were the ones that I thought I was calculating and logical and making planned it pros and cons lists. And those are the ones that don't work out. And the gut decisions, the ones from your body, your yeah. body says, do this. Yeah. They all work out, don't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I have even more access to that, so. Yeah, so after all this work now, You've done all this work. You've been hanging out with Felix. He keeps coming back and assisting at all our workshops. Can't get rid of me. Yeah, he loves to be here. He does amazing work. He's, he's your dating life. Can you talk about how much your life has transformed before I talk about the uh, assisting? Because it you keeps know, transforming and it has transformed. Right? It's interesting because it's both subtle and powerful and, and it's both uh, clear and cloudy. It's so interesting because when I'm not accessing, trying to calculate how my life has changed through my brain, then it just becomes this sort of flowing feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and as you were talking, I thought, wow, I don't think, and I'm listening to you, we're making eye contact and feeling each other and I'm hearing what you're saying, feeling what you're saying. And that was, that's one of the huge things that's happened for me for this year is that my natural ability just to sit in connection with people, men, women, old friends is uh, growing every day. And it's at a point now where I can talk to someone without trying to solve or plan ahead. I can start to start being in the present moment. So you can feel their emotions, relate to their emotions. Yeah. Because you can't do that when you're planning. And that's why no. the people don't feel heard when you're calculating ahead. No. And um, even if I, if like for a moment, I feel like in my body how I was three years ago or two years ago, it gives me a headache. Mm -hmm. The amount of plotting and the planning and the, okay, if I could do this, it's like, what about your dating life? Because you know, a lot of guys are watching this, they're older, they want to change their dating yeah. life. They think, God, I'm in my 50s or I'm in my 60s or 40s. Some guys think, yeah. some guys think they can't change their dating life because they're in their late 30s and they're like, or I know that's funny. Yeah, yeah. it makes yeah. me laugh. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, you know, I've seen guys get with women up in their 70s, and you know, my dad could probably get women, and he's in his 80s. So. Yeah. But he's married. So, just like the natural permission that I have now to talk to who I want to talk to is mm -hmm. growing every day. It's still there's self abusive voice saying you're not there you're not there yet. Well, I'm I'm here now, uh, and growing on the idea of I like who I like. I it's not that I I'm dating a, a young woman right now. We've been going out for seven or eight months. She's 22, mm -hmm. and uh, and you guys are blissfully happy together. Right? Yeah, we talk about it. we joke that we're not boyfriend girlfriend. We're not dating. She likes to say we're lovers. And that's that really, sounds much sexier, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
<clears throat> and she's and awesome. It's, it's, it's amazing how you light up when you talk about her too. Yeah, 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 yeah. She makes me feel good. She sends me nice texts like over the weekend. How's everything going? And just natural flow. And my older friends say, well, "You're dang, you're a woman that age." Well, they always say the same thing. What do you talk about? What do I talk about? I always laugh when people say that to me. <laughs> you need things to talk about, and I'm like, I've dated women a lot younger than me. I've dated women my age. And yeah. The only, the real difference, the only real difference is women my age can remember some of the TV shows I watched when I was young and have some data around that. But young women have just as much access and sometimes more to deep emotions, feelings, sensations, 100%. expression of those emotions. And that's what real life, real communication is that's about. That's what I was going to say. We talk about how we feel. We talk about things that excite us. We talk about our day, my day. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean who wants to talk about 1970s politics? Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> that tv it's it's fun once in a while to talk about a song from but i find that a lot of it it's funny how many women i date that are a lot younger than me when and they know those songs <laughs> so oh yeah about songs. oh yeah oh, i love <laughs> 80s music I love, oh my god I love, you know and it's like and they start rambling off better than i can i'm like jesus yeah yeah, yeah listen to this she didn't know who bruce springsteen was but she one day she put on barry white and uh, so it's like, okay, I don't know what you know, but <laughs> you know Barry White, that's cool. Yeah. And then yeah. I've rated women my age too, because there are women, I'm very young in energy, and so I'll run into women my age that are also young in energy. I'll date them, they're fun to date. But I've also tried to go out with women my age that were, they just, and it's not their physical age, but they just, they're hardened. They've lost touch with their femininity. So when I get around, I really do appreciate Young women, younger women who are still in touch with their femininity, but I also appreciate when I run into a woman that's closer to my age and her femininity is still flowing. It's sexy. It's beautiful. That's exactly how I, it's not that I don't want to date older women, but I like to, I like women who are in flow, have a younger energy, more access to their heart. Yeah. And their intuitive uh, nature, their femininity. Their intuitive nature, femininity. I'm just attracted to that. Yeah. Um, and can let a lot of women pass by now that if I don't feel that, you know, we're talking about manifesting. Oh, that's the thing. I manifested the girl I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you talking about you, you, you actually painted a picture over in your mind. We have something called energetic modeling. So yeah. you program the subconscious mind to find certain things, create certain things. So you did a lot of energetic modeling on this woman. Yeah, yeah, and the image was as a gal. I don't had no idea what her age was. was. Very curly, curly, dark hair, Latina looking, flashing eyes, dancing. She was, in my mind, she was dancing for me, and I'd done it for a few months, and then I forgot about it, and I'd stopped doing it. Then I met her, and uh, and then one day on her second date, uh, we were lying in bed, and she jumps up and she starts dancing for me, and it was exactly the image that I had that in my manifestation through energetic modeling. Crazy. Yeah. And it just went, I had the shock go through my system. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And that's when you realize you were, you will have the ability to create when you, when you no longer attached, that's the key is you, once you release, think of it as you're in a, in, in the ocean and you're swimming and there's waves everywhere. And what you're really learning to do is ride and maneuver those waves versus control everything literally. And as you surrender the need to have the wave go the way you want and have everything go the way you want and you're unattached to that, it's amazing how, how easy it is to ride the wave in a way that makes you end up on the beach where you want. So you see what I mean? You're working with the energies to, to working with the flow of everything. Yeah. So creation isn't about controlling the world. Creation is about working with everything. And then the less attached you are to outcome, the more what you want can wash up on the shore and show up for you. I was just writing a blog post that was entitled Soften Your Hunter's Gaze. And I, what I was experimenting in traveling in Bali the last few weeks was all these spiritual girls, all these surfer girls. And I thought, God, I just, they all look, there's not feeling a heart connection with any of these girls. They're, you know, these spiritual girls. And, and then I thought, what if I just felt the crowd? And I had that image of this open, this open hearted, sweet energy. And, and it was like, they all faded to the background. I was in one moment, they all, all those spiritual girls faded in the background at this spirit festival. And one girl just like, whoa, 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 came forward. And then at that moment, it's like, oh, and then my body just went, talk to her. 
and you ended up, you talked to her twice, right? You ended up meeting her? Yeah, yeah, and it was just a quick, she was from Egypt, she just had this so much heart, emanating heart energy that she stood out from the crowd for me. Yeah, you had a nice conversation with her, didn't you? Yeah, it was short, it was very short, but it was really connected, and it was just, very so you sweet. can keep doing that until you find the, the girl you want. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these uh, energetic spirit festivals. Like, I used to be big in the New Age community. Went early on in my about personal development career. I lived in a yoga community and I did all that stuff. The the problem is with everything, and I'm not just talking about that. Is that we get our egos gets wrapped up in it so much that it becomes it's it's like spiritual spiritual elitism or mm. I'm, and you can say that almost about anything. I'm elite because I do this. I'm elite because I do that. I'm elite because I'm, I'm, and it's, you wouldn't think of it this way, but it's almost like I'm special because I'm the most broken victim-y person, you know? Yeah. And in, in any way with the ego is looking to be unique and special. So look at the way you define yourself as special and release all the attachment and the want to be special in that energy. Yeah. And that's where I think when you go to a lot of these events, you get people that are like, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm this, and I'm... I call it spiritual arrogance. Yeah. It's, it's a very strange irony. Yeah. It's very accurate, actually. Yeah. And it's not that the energies taught aren't aren't there, but a lot of people that are talking about them have no real experience of them. They'll talk about chakras and have no real relationship to chakras, no. or they'll talk about Reiki and you can't, and they have, they don't, you know, and, and they, they don't cultivate their lower energies. They just cultivate the heart. They don't cultivate their turn on, their grounding, their, 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 they're dirty, the animal inside of them. You got to cultivate that. Yeah. The yeah. The men feminine. were pretty feminine at this festival, mm -hmm. even though they were trying to look very masculine. Yeah. And nobody was really touching the ground. David Data talks about it. He said there was a, a woman came to one of his talks and she, she was raised her hand. She was part of the a spiritual community. It was giving a talk at a yoga community, just like this. And, and she said, you know, sometimes, uh, um, I, uh, I gotta admit something. Like I'm in this community and we got all these guys here and they're spiritual and they're new agey. And sometimes I just got to sneak out. I go down into town and I go to the biker bar and I pick up on a biker and I have wild sex all night. And I just want them to take me and ravage me and, 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 and bend me over and it just feels so good. And yeah. what does that tell you? She needs that lower energy that so many of these, that these new agey guys shut off. It's because I don't, I don't want to. Yeah. And it's this energy of, I'm a man, I can handle it, I'm showing up right in front of you, I, I can penetrate, I, and I can, I can protect, I can contain, I can lead, and I create a nice space for your feminine to blossom in, to be, yeah. and to be everything, and I'm going to watch it, witness it, and enjoy every fucking second of it, because yeah. I'm a man. Whereas the, the other guys are nice guys. Spiritual elitist nice guys, but they're still nice guys. Yeah, if a if a biker with that energy showed up, I'm just visualizing if you showed up in the middle of that spirit festival, yeah. the crowds would part. Yeah. They would know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah it would be awesome. It's cute the way you dance, but come here. <laughs> I want to see your ass, you know. Yeah. Girls would act offended and probably like it on some <laughs> level, you know. There's this whole idea like, yeah, you want to enjoy women, but you also want to see the human being inside. But you also still want to witness that like, she's sexy. She's got a sexy body, but she's also there's also a human in the soul. And sometimes with one energy is more dominant than the other. Yeah. But don't deny one energy for the other. Yeah. 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 That's the problem. Yeah. So uh, with all this, you you you're, you really completed this cycle uh, because somebody said to you, you know, you you said earlier somebody said to you, why don't you teach some of this now? How did this how did this come about? Remind me. I well, can't I yeah, I. Uh, Coaching, yeah. I've been coaching for like the last, my own clients for like the last nine months. I was... Um, you know, started something in San Francisco, right? Yeah, in San, Fran San Francisco. Sorry. And I got a couple of guys on Zoom now that I just, I was just getting encouragement from, I mean, helping out with you guys. I began to realize I had a certain... And he still comes down and assists at almost at half our workshops at least, if not 75% of oh, our yeah. experience workshop. You come and assist, show up, and, and we love having him there because he... Yeah. He's good with you guys. He really shows up for you guys. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that you were introducing me one day and you, you asked, you said, you know why Sam shows up here on his own dime? And I'm thinking, I wonder what he's going to say. And you said, because he loves you guys. Mm. And I went, that's exactly why I'm here. Any guy who shows up in a room like this, I. Big heart, yeah. I feel them immediately. You come here, you help them change their lives. Your life grows a little more each time. Each time. Yeah, yeah, and everybody, it's a win-win. 
I started to realize that I, when I was walking around the streets, you know, in the, in the street exercises we do with the guys, that over time I started realizing that anybody who I walked with, no matter how nervous they were, always talked to a girl. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what I said. You got a very grounding energy. I guess I grounded them out. I whispered something that transformational. I didn't even know what I was doing. I thought, wow, I got something. So that's when I started realizing. Then the voice in my head said, you're not a master seducer. You can't teach anybody shit. And then I said, well, I can, there's certain men that I can lift up. And I just said, once I had that, made that decision, once I'd set that voice free that was pulling me down, it was just like, oh, I'll just build a website. And I built a website to, mm-hmm. and just started inviting people. Yeah. And you meet women. You meet women all the time. Meet women. Yeah. They just they kind of women. flow in and out of my life. I mean, mm-hmm. some days I'll go out to meet women and, and work on the things, the principles that we, we have and help ground myself because I'm constantly learning how to ground mm-hmm. myself. And now I'm here and I want to, I want to be here. So it's, it's, it's just this gradual, it's this stair step. Yeah. It just keeps going on. And on. It just keeps going on and on. Yeah. Yeah. And I just keep watching you and I love being around you. I love hanging out with you. So, um, uh, what's your, what's your website, by the way? It's my name, sampond.com. P-O-N-D. And then, uh, go there for a free w- ebook. I'll send you my ebook. Okay. Yeah, please do. Yeah. It's really cool. How long is it? 25 pages. Oh, nice. Uh, a nice giveaway ebook. It's a little yeah, giveaway, giveaway yeah. ebook and guys who read it say, oh, I read your ebook and I went out and talked to a girl. So nice. I thought there was good, doesn't it? Yeah. So, um, so Sam coaches here and he also yep. coaches at his own stuff. He, uh, he may end up becoming a coach for Fearless someday. We'll see. That'd be awesome. Um, I love hanging out with you guys. Yeah, we love having him here. He just makes everybody happy. Miles, you're great. You're great. Help really keep a solid container. Yeah. So the whole idea of a container is keeping a room tight so people can learn. No distractions. Everything's grounded. Yeah, I'm the sergeant at arms the last yeah. uh, few. And he's done a great job of it. So um, any last things you want to say to the guy, especially the older clients? Like you got to remember, Sam's out here coaching. He's 63 years old yesterday. Yeah. He's coaching. And he's killing it. He's got a 22 year old, 22 year yeah. old lover, and, lover. Uh, yeah. and other girls you, you travel and see around the world. Yeah. And you're just kind of flowing, and you're on, you're in Bali one week, or in, you're really enjoying it. Oh, yeah. Life. I've had I've Costa Rica this year, uh, Valencia, Budapest, uh, Las Valencia's places. coming up, right? Yeah. And Valencia's coming up again. And I may go to Valencia. We'll see. We'll just hang out with Sam for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that'd be great. We're uh, going to go to Bali together. Yes. I want to go to, definitely want to go to Bali. I've been wanting to go to Bali for years and Sam was just there and I was like, he started talking about it. I'm like, oh. Yeah. You there know, you go. I want to go to beach communities because I spend so much time in the mountains with snow and, and, and Europe and Yeah. I got like a place that. for us together. Nice. Perfect. In Bali? Yeah. Okay. Changu. It's, it's on. I yeah. want to go to Bali. I want to go to the Philippines. I want to go to Thailand. It'll all happen. They always do. You picture it long enough, it shows up. So with that said, is there any last bit of anything you want to say to, yeah, to the audience out there? I know this has been a long interview, but I think it's been a, a really important one, especially for you guys that are older. You know, you guys think you can't do it and, and you can change your life. You can change your life. Really can. Yeah, you know, just sort of feeling that question now, I feel sort of, I feel this mournfulness for guys out there right now. This, this, that there's a, there's this feeling of constriction around their hearts and their balls that it just feels small and that life is getting smaller. That's what it feels like. Yeah. And that you, I just want them to understand that that's just, it's not you, it's not them. They're not responsible for this constriction. It's just something that got, it's like this brainwashing, this body washing, whatever you want to call it. Society's always programming us. And the the key is, can we get conscious enough that we don't take on the programming anymore? We just constantly let it go. Yeah. And so that's all that they understand that the, this idea of I'm getting, yes, technically we are getting older, but I don't know when I made the decision not to get older. In fact, I don't think I made a decision not to get older, but somewhere along the line, I just said, okay, this body is not, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to age. Mm-hmm. And that comes with releasing all these stories of what aging uh, means. And I see this more and more, even with myself. I see people out there that I'm not aging much. I see uh, there's a woman I follow that's got a fitness channel and she just looks absolutely amazing. She's 50 years old, looks spectacular. Mm. And there's just so many I run into it and I'm just like always shocked. And uh, Zan looks amazing. And I start hearing more and more about how people are just going to stay young longer and longer. There's some great documentaries on stuff that's coming down the pike. And, and literally, it's an energy. 
Yeah. Age is a number. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it really is. Oh, well, 100% number. is just a number. Because yeah. that's just how you quantify the time. Yeah. But everything else is, you know, I just hear that it's too late. It's too late for me. Uh, it's not too late mm -hmm. to access that energetic part of you that doesn't want it to be too late. There was this documentary I saw, it kind of made me sad, but it was called How to Live Forever, uh, Results May Vary. And uh, <laughs> it's a documentary on anti-aging, but there was one guy in there, I love this guy. His name was Buster. He was, at the time of the documentary, he was 101. He was just so full of life, this guy. And he's sitting there on camera, he's living in England. He was French born, grew up in England. He was still working. He was washing vans and, and for this, he was, he'd retired physical ed teacher washing vans at this uh, plumbing company every day. At the end of the day, he'd wash all the vans and they came in and you know, perfectly healthy. And he's like sitting there on camera and they're interviewing him. He's like, I'm not like you people. Like, and they're like, what does that mean? He's like, normal. I'm not normal like you people. <laughs> and he says, I, you know, basically I do what I want to do. And then he's out there at 101 running full marathons. And he's, but he says he doesn't drink water. I don't know if this can't be true, but he, maybe it is. He says, I don't drink water, I just drink beer. And I drink at every break on the marathon, I have a beer and, and a cigarette. And then I go out and run the next phase of the marathon. And you see him running down the street, how solid and grounded he is. There's some video clips of him in the boxing ring at 101, boxing around, dancing and fight. Then there's some video clips and he's just moving nice. And then he's talking about in his 90s, he was in a rock band. He was playing in a rock band doing that in his 90s. And so he just, I love the fact that he said, I'm not normal. Because yeah. I think once you decide I'm just a normal 60-year-old or 50-year-old, then you're just buying into a mm -hmm. story of being a 50 or 60-year-old. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Yeah. And he lived to be 104. Um, he literally never stopped working. He never stopped having adventures. He went to work one day uh, at 104. Because he kept a sense of purpose by doing all this. This is what keeps you alive and young. And they said, they said he basically went to the pub that he loves to go hang out with his friends, had a beer and a cigarette and just died. Yeah. That was it, he was done. Yeah. He moved on. And that's, that's a life lived, you know. I was just thinking about those guys. How do you transfer my, uh, what do I call it? My spiritual awakening? Because I think all these guys have a sense of dissatisfaction, like a rumbling dissatisfaction past 50 years old. Like, is this it? And all we do is find a way we'll watch TV or drink or hang with our friends or play golf to keep that rumbling at bay. Yeah. And it's the only thing I would recommend to a guy to do is to create your own shokuboku. Yeah. Sit, go sit on an island without your phone and deeply reflect on your life and let your whole life fall apart. Do you know who Walter Russell is? Yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah, he's a great teacher from the 1900s, and he lived to be 90 <coughs> something, 92, 93, before he passed away. He's never stopped working, full life, did amazing things, advisor to the president. He probably was one of the most successful human beings of, the, of that century, and nobody knows who he is. But Walter Russell said a great man's life doesn't begin until 50. He, he doesn't actualize his full power until 50, and then he yeah. starts creating. And, uh, George Bernard Shaw. Energetically men if they if they're leading life the way they're supposed to they really start showing up around 50 and then they start creating and building and giving back to the world around 50. before that they're preparing for everything yeah so what happens is if you look at this guy's life yeah he was uh he's famous for uh paintings he's famous for drawings he's famous for statues he's famous for his uh, work in science he's famous for his work uh he brought uh, ice skating to the United States in, in Madison Square Garden. He yeah, trained dancing stallions. He's famous for music. He does real estate deals. He, he was a true Renaissance man. He was advisor to the president at the time, and nobody knows his name. Mm -hmm. He was best friends with uh, um, Tesla. And Tesla said his works were too advanced for society when he passed away, so they should be locked up. Because they, and uh, his, his books on science are, a lot of people look at them as almost like quantum physics today. Back then they called them Brazilian science. People just didn't understand them. He was and, too busy creating rather than seeking validation. Right. He would put it out and move on. Yeah. And he said, like, with the science, he said, I realized, like I said, I was going to show the world how easy it is to understand science. So I was writing all this stuff on science and I looked at the current science books and I looked at how complex they were. And I said, wow, their egos are really wrapped up in this. That's yeah. why they make it so complex. He says, so they're not going to be able to accept what I have. So I'm just going to put it out there and move on. Yeah. He says, because if I put it out there and say, this is, their egos are going to get all wrapped up in, no, no, I put all these years into learning. This is the, right. and he said, so I just put it out there and, and long after he's dead, people are now looking at it and amazed with his work. Tesla was amazed with his work back then. Yeah, yeah. And this is why I don't think he's world famous. No dramas. Yeah, right. You no know? drama. Yeah. No seeking. No, no chasing, no trying to prove anything. Just, I'm just living my life. Yeah.
and uh, I think he had one minor drama in his life that people talked about. And it was he divorced his wife and married somebody else rather quickly. This boom done. This is it. This relationship's done. This relationship started, and that was it. Yeah. And they moved on. Again, he lets go really fast. So I want to say that that guy says, look at all the stuff he accomplished in his life and how much he accomplished after 50, if you ever look at his life. There's a great little book called The Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe. That's the one. I remember that book. Yeah. Amazing book. Yeah, what a huge advantage to have 50 years of experience under your belt that builds up all this energy and then you release it through working with you guys or whatever they choose. And you could just like, you're going to bring something to women and younger women that that any young man did, that wouldn't even have a clue how to tap mm-hmm. or touch or feel. And I would love to start, uh, maybe someday we'll work with women, teaching them to tap into that feminine spirit at any age. Because oh, uh, and that. That, that would be another beautiful thing, is just watching these women just light up a room with their yeah. femininity at any age. Yeah. So many women should turn it off because our modern society teaches them to do it as they yep. get older. Yeah, you know? that would be a gift to all the yeah. guys out there. Yeah. Um, so with that said, uh, your website is sampond.com. Sampond.com. Okay, check it out. Uh, any, anything else you would like to say in closing? Yeah, that uh, we were just talking about my, that story about sharing with a, one of the guys in the experience last night. He asked me on my birthday, what was my best year? Oh, yeah, that's right. And what was he your best said, year? Uh, and he said his best year, he's talking about my age, he said his best year was 32. He has got very wistful about 32. And my answer was this year. My 62nd year was absolutely my best year. Started to get more flow, just a lot more freedom, a lot more connection with the world and adventure and just feeling more, just more flow. And I have this feeling you're going to have better years than 62 down the road. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. As those, all those voices start to lose their power as I get more in touch with my body, it's... Yeah. As I get older, I'm amazed at how much happier I get. I remember... Um, no, yeah more and more I wake up feeling this sense of joy in my heart than I ever had before in my life. Yeah. And I do, can even remember it being asleep in that sense of joy. Like where they used to be asleep and I'd wake up and they get kind of tight. And now I'll come into this groggy kind of half awake state and there's this, and I can feel my heart and I can feel everything feels great. And then I just kind of fall back to sleep. And that happens to me now. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty amazing what happens. It's like, and then you just sleep like a baby. Yeah. And uh, more and more of that's happening too. So, um, with that said, uh, I want to thank you for being here. I know oh, this man. is a vulnerable interview for you. Yeah. And, uh, it was really good. Thanks. So some, some highlights. Check out that Tom Waits song. What was it called? Kentucky Avenue. Kentucky Avenue. Um, if you're an older gentleman and you want to really change your life in this area, mm. well, first question is, 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 and I want you to put in the comments, guys. What was your best year? Just really is a thought. Think about that. What was your best year? And if you got something out of this uh, video, make sure to comment about it. Make sense, because I think it's an important video because so many people write themselves off as they get older, men and women. Yeah. So and if you're people. older and if your best year wasn't this last year, then something to think about. Yeah. How can you make the next year even better? Yeah. And if you want to learn more about what we do, maybe come down to Meet Sam Pond. Go to uh, thefearlessman.com. Check that out. Or go to our YouTube channel, where you're probably already at. But youtube.com uh, slash thefearlessman. And uh, with that said, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to like if you like the video. And, uh, I, and again, thank you, Sam. And you re- bet. And do remember, it. Change your life. And remember, only the confident really live. Okay. See you in the next video. Thank you.